There's this whole branch of statistics out there called survival analysis, also known as time to event analysis. So what exactly is this and when should you use it? Well, in this video, I'm gonna cover that. I'm Richard and this is Richard on Data. So over the years, survival analysis is one of the approaches that I've come back to and used the most personally, probably more so than any other method other than, say, regression models. A lot of that has to do with the industries I've worked in because I've spent most of my working life so far in healthcare and pharma. And in those industries and several others, survival analysis is applicable to a ton of different problems. So in this video, I'm gonna cover what it even is, the type of data and real world use cases in which it's applicable, some of the key concepts, and some of the most common methods. If all that sounds good to you, subscribe to my channel if you haven't already, and take just a fraction of a second to smash the like button, because it really helps me get noticed by the YouTube algorithm. So let's start with the most foundational question, which is, what exactly is survival analysis in the first place? Well, broadly speaking, it's a branch of statistics that helps us when we're interested in the time until some event of interest occurs. There are all kinds of applications of this. More generally, think of any event where, given enough time, it's going to happen. The most obvious example is right there in the name. Survival until we die, which we all do. There's plenty of other examples. In healthcare, you could have time until relapse or until some other sort of significant medical event occurs. And for marketing, it could be customer churn or time until your customer stops using your product or service. Here's a pretty instructive real-world example. So, this is a good one out there from the State University at Cortland, looking at survival time and probabilities of patients from that sickness that started in late 2019, early 2020, and the effect that things like time in a ventilator, the patient's age, and various patient comorbidities have on survival probability. So you might be wondering, we're working with a binary outcome here, so why do we even need this field of methods? Like, why can't we just use logistic regression or some kind of ML algorithm for classification? Well, for one thing, these methods generally don't incorporate time as a centerpiece. Time is a crucial factor in survival analysis, and as you'll see, it allows us to estimate survival probability over time. And the other huge thing is, survival analysis helps us account for what's known as censored data. So what's sensor data? Well, there's two main kinds of sensor data, that is right-censored and left-censored, and right-censored is by far the more common of the two. So with right-censored data, that usually occurs when somebody prematurely withdraws from the study, or the study just has to come to a close. You know that the subject hasn't experienced that event up to that point in time, but you don't know when eventually they're going to experience it. Now with left sensor data, it's a different situation. So you know the subject has experienced the event before some time point, you just don't know exactly when. So let's look at some examples of these two. Here's an example from Minitab. Here the study is on pregnant women and the event in question is having their baby. So let's say on one hand, we're finishing up the study and we need to analyze the data. Let's say for patient five over here, we observe them from 293 days and there's still no baby. That's a very long pregnancy. We know the pregnancy will last longer than 293 days. We just don't know how much. So that's an example of right sensor data. But then on the other hand, suppose we were analyzing women who were at the 250 day mark and just based on how we collected the data, we know some of them already had their babies, we just don't know exactly on what day they did. That's an example of left sensor data. So a key to survival analysis is what's known as the survival function, and that's what we're going to estimate through some of these methods. And the idea here is to estimate by some time t, what the probability of experiencing or not experiencing the event by that time t is. Often we're interested in what's known as the median survival, which is the time at which the survival probability has fallen to 50%. It's probably easiest to illustrate this with some examples. Now, the visualization of this is known as the Kaplan-Meier curve. 
Now, this is an example from the Boston University School of Public Health. The outcome they're tracking here is onset of dementia, and there are two different groups. One group is elderly people who frequently played board games such as chess, checkers, backgammon, or cards at a baseline time, and the other is people who rarely played such games. So you've got time on the x-axis and the survival probability on the y-axis. That gives us a probability of surviving, in this case free of dementia, up to that point or later. More on this later, but since the played frequently group is fully on the outside of the played rarely group, it looks like the played frequently group is doing better. And if we're interested in the median survival time, just eyeball a horizontal line from the survival probability around 0.5. That would mean that after about eight years or so, 50% of the played rarely group gets dementia, but it takes maybe about 12 to 13 years for 50% of the played frequently group to get dementia. So unfortunately, the analysis of this is a little bit more rigorous than simply eyeballing a graph and deciding one function looks a little bit more on the outside than the other. Well, that's where something called the log rank test comes in. And before I talk about that, one other function we need to think about is what's known as the hazard function. In simple terms, this function measures the probability of the event occurring in an infinitesimally small time interval, given that the subject has already survived up to that point. Basically, the higher this function, the more risk, or the more hazard, the subject is in. And this is inversely related to the survival function. So with a log rank test, we're comparing different groups. Our null hypothesis assumes that the different groups have identical hazard functions. Now putting that another way, if the groups have identical hazard functions, they would have identical survival functions. So under this null hypothesis, the test statistic we use has a chi-square distribution. And here's another link from Boston University with more detail about this, and you can read this in more detail. But essentially, when we compute this test statistic, it relies on calculating the observed and expected number of events over time, assuming the null hypothesis is true. And if you reject the null hypothesis, you conclude that the hazard function of one group is different from the other. So to this point, we've covered the survival and hazard functions, comparing groups using a log rank test, and eyeballing their survival functions using a Kaplan-Meier curve. Survival analysis is also rich with many different types of models. So the ones that are most similar to conventional ML methods are what's known as survival trees or survival forests, which these are pretty fascinating in their own right. There's also parametric examples, a pretty common one being what's known as the accelerated failure time model. But the most famous example of survival model, and the last topic that I'm gonna cover in this video, is what's known as the Cox proportional hazards model. So if we're thinking about this at a very high level, the proportional hazards model can be used in a very similar way to something like a logistic regression model. You have one or more variables, and the model's gonna give you coefficients and test statistics for all of them. Using those, we can determine if the covariates have a statistically significant relationship with hazard rate. So this is all pretty intuitive, easy to use, and straightforward, right? Well, in most cases, yes. But there is one major assumption that we need to know about, and that's what's known as the proportional hazards assumption. So the proportional hazards assumption states that the hazard ratio between two individuals or groups stays constant over time. Let's put that another way. So let's suppose you're doing a study and you're looking at subjects that took different treatments. If you find at the beginning of the study that the hazard rate for subjects who take treatment A is twice as high as for subjects who take treatment B, the assumption states that the hazard for treatment A will remain twice as high throughout the entire study. That's a pretty big assumption, but it's also a really important one. So the model gets really unreliable if this isn't the case. So this is definitely something you wanna be checking before you go creating a proportional hazards model. But anyway, let's look at an example of this, again from Boston University. This study's outcome is all-cause mortality between men and women participating in the Framingham Heart Study. Down here, we have the risk factors, parameter estimates, and p-values. 
And starting with the p-values, the interpretation is just like you'd expect. Supposing you're using a 5% significance level, then a p-value under 0.05 indicates that covariate has a statistically significant relationship with subject hazard. As far as the parameter estimates go, these estimate the increase in the expected log of the relative hazard for each one unit increase in that variable, holding other predictors constant. That's easiest to understand by exponentiating them. So the example they give here is by exponentiating the age coefficient in the upper table, 0.11149 to get 1.118. So that means there's an 11.8% increase in the expected hazard relative to a one year increase in age, holding everything else constant. Or to make it even simpler, positive coefficients indicate higher risk, negative coefficients imply lower risk. So I'm gonna leave you there with the ideas behind survival analysis. Hopefully you're getting the idea now though that this is an incredibly rich branch of statistics with tons to explore in it. There's tons of applications of it and lots of things that you can do. And luckily in Python or R, there's tons of packages for doing exactly that, the links of which will be in the description. But to summarize the most important point, if you're working with some event that you can reasonably assume will happen to everyone given enough time, whether or not you even observe this happening to everyone in your data, and the time until that event occurs is interesting, then survival analysis is almost definitely applicable to your problem. So thanks for watching this video. If you enjoyed it, hit the like button. If you didn't enjoy it, you're welcome to hit the dislike button, I suppose. Leave me a comment down below and let me know what you think of survival analysis. Do you love it? Has it been useful for you? Do you hate it? Let me know. Then I'll see you all in the not-so-distant future. Until then, Richard, on data.